Section 11 of The Outline of Science, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle. The Outline of Science by J. Arthur Thompson. Chapter 20. The Characteristics of Living Creatures. The All-Round View. We may take an animal to pieces, as the anatomist is always doing, and a wonderful analysis it is, especially when we place other lenses in front of our own. We may inquire into the go of the various parts, as a physiologist seeks to do, and we have seen what an intricate engine the body is. We may watch the almost transparent egg of a moth gradually divide and redivide and develop into a tiny caterpillar, which, even more marvelously, becomes a butterfly, the embryologist's task. And we may work among fossils till we are able to throw upon the present the light of a distant past, which is the paleontologist's ambition. These methods are all essential if we are to begin to understand living creatures, but they are not altogether adequate. We must also have an all-round or synoptic view of living creatures. We must see life whole. What would we think of an astronomer who kept to a spectroscope and never enjoyed the splendor of the star-strewn sky? And it is even more important for the biologist than for the astronomer to have the synoptic view, because life is such an elusive kind of activity. We cannot hope to get to grips with it unless we approach it in every possible way. So laying aside analysis, let us consider the characteristics of living creatures when we look at them in an all-round impressionist way. In so doing, we shall follow, with the permission of the publishers, Messrs. Williams and Norgate, J. Arthur Thompson's System of Animate Nature, Volume 1, 1920, pages 50 through 56. It is surely a magnificent spectacle that animate nature presents. What a gamut of life from the microscopic infusorian to the giant whale, from the hessop on the wall to the cedar of Lebanon. What abundance of life is revealed when the dredge comes up, or when insects rise before us in a cloud as we walk through the grassland in a hot country? What variety of architecture, what abundance of individuality within the same style? All is suggestive of fertile imagination. How strong the pressure! As the waves of life surge up against their shores, we call this the struggle for existence. How numberless the hand and glove fitnesses, or adaptations, how subtle the linkages in the web of life, how constant the changefulness or variability, how universal the beauty. But let us think over the deeper impressions which fill the mind after the crowd of details sinks to rest. These deeper impressions form part of the materials which biology gives over to philosophy to build with. A multitude of individualities, yet a sistema natura, innumerable species. When we look at nature with a fresh eye, in a new country, or in some novel experience such as dredging, we have a transient impression of overwhelming confusion, as if Aladdin's cave had suddenly burst open before us. Many miss this in ordinary circumstances, because familiarity breeds the contempt of inattention, and also because a very large number of living creatures live a hidden life. For every conspicuous plant there are a score inconspicuous, and for every readily visible animal there must be a hundred unseen. It is not of individuals that we are thinking, but of individualities of species. On a very moderate estimate of species, there are at least 25,000 named backboned animals, 10 times as many named backboneless animals, and about as many plants. There are 100,000 dicotyledonous flowering plants. Darwin speaks of finding 20 different kinds of flowering plants on a patch of turf 4 feet by 3, and there may be as many different kinds of animals on one stone brought up from the sea floor. The study of marine animals has been enthusiastic and intense for many years, but those who know most about it will agree with what the poet Spencer said long ago. But what an endless worker have I in hand to count the sea's abundant progeny, whose fruitful seed the fairest passes those on land, and also those which wanna in the azure sky, for much more earth to tell the stars on high. I'll be the endless seam in estimation, 
than to recount the sea's prosperity so fit to be the floods and generation so huge their numbers and so numberless of their nation the problem of individuality or species is very difficult but our view of nature as a whole must take account of the fact that species are multitudinous and that they represent discontinuous individualities with much more constancy than earlier darwinian supposed linnaeus said there are as many species as there are ideas in the divine mind and there is no doubt that a good species is like a clear-cut idea at the other extreme of comparison it is like a chemical element but on a higher plane as goethe said the one thing nature seems to aim at is individuality yet she cares nothing for individuals if we personify animate nature it must at least be as an artist with inexhaustible imaginative resources with extraordinary mastery of materials but in the prodigal wealth of individuality it is not a demonic confusion but a rational order that we see the species are remarkably unique and discontinuous each with a character of its own yet they are often like stages in individual development and they can often be classified in logical series linnaeus established his systema natura quite apart from any evolutionist conception and though the fact of what we may call blood relationship lies behind every so-called natural classification our present point is simply that orderly classifability is undeniable as goethe said each of her works has an essence of its own each of her phenomena a special characterization and yet their diversity is in unity abundance and insurgence of life a second impression is that of wealth of numbers and of indomitable will to live there are indeed organisms which multiply slowly such as elephants golden eagles and century plants but this is not the way with the majority most of the streams of life are ever tending to overflow their banks even the rarities may do so in appropriate conditions thus a rather rare wingless glacier insect was recently found on one stretch of the mer de glace at chamonix in numbers almost equal to the population of great britain and ireland in the case of organisms of low individuation which hold their own rather because they are many than because they are strong or wise the prodigality of productivity is beyond all our powers of conception from one infusorian there may be a million by the end of the week and in some of the floating meadows of the sea there may be a quarter of a million units in a gallon of water there is a well-known british starfish luidia chiliaris which produces at least two hundred millions of eggs and yet it is not what one would call a common animal we are familiar with calculations of what would occur if there were no thinning of the crops how soon the earth would be covered with a weed or the sea filled solid with a fish or the sky darkened with an insect and recurrent plagues or locusts sparrows rabbits and moles remind us that a possibility may easily become an actuality after allowing a prodigious mortality of ninety five per cent it is computed that the ten million pairs of breeding rats in great britain on new year's day nineteen eighteen were represented by forty million pairs at the end of the year and by twelve million more pairs the following month there is a grimness in the well-known remarks of linnaeus that three flies will consume the carcass of a horse as quickly as a lion can professor woodruff observed the common asexual generations of the common slipper animalculae parmesian for five years between nineteen o seven and nineteen twelve and found that there were three thousand twenty nine of them over three every forty eight hours careful calculations showed that they had given evidence of the capacity of producing in the five years a volume of protoplasm approximately equal to ten thousand times the volume of the earth this power of self-increase must be taken account of in our conception of living organisms and the resulting abundance of life must form part of our impressionist picture of animate nature at the autumnal climax of productivity in lakes there may be to the square yard seven thousand millions of a well-known diatom melocera variants so that the water is like a living soup we have to remember moreover the obvious but notable fact that we are dealing not with items like grains of sand but with individuals each itself and no other mendel put an end to the phrase as like as two peas individuals differ greatly in degree of complexity and of integration many an infusorian has an intricate organization and lives a by no means monotonous life though it is only what we sometimes fallaciously call a single cell hardly any larger than some infusorians are some of the rotifers sometimes with about one thousand cells a minnow has its millions and a bird its millions of millions 
what a contrast between the very incipient integration of a sponge the intricate division of labor in a portuguese man-of-war hesitating between colony and individual and the compact coordination of the circumspect wren as a recent student of the subject mr julian s huxley puts it we are confronted in nature with closed independent systems with harmonious parts and with capacity for continuance such are individuals though the closure is never complete the independence never absolute the harmony never perfect yet systems and tendency alike have real existence the individual is unity in diversity in what it is and what it does a whole whose diverse parts all work together ensuring continuance when it transcends the limits of its substance mr huxley says that is personality but in addition to the abundance of life alike of individualities and of individuals there is the quality of insurgence living creatures press up against all barriers they fill every possible niche all the world over they show that nature abhors a vacuum we find animals among the snow and monta rosa at a height of over ten thousand feet we dredge them from the floor of the sea from those great depths of over six miles where mount everest would be much more than engulfed it is hard to say what difficulties living creatures may not conquer or circumvent you may find insects in hot springs in which you cannot keep your hand immersed or rotifers and other small fry under fifteen feet of ice in the little lakes of antarctica you find a brine shrimp and two or three other animals in the great salt lake you find a fish climbing a tree and thoroughly terrestrial types like spiders having species living under water there is as sir arthur shipley has shown a bustle of life on the dry twigs of the heather when we consider the filling of every niche the finding of homes in extraordinary places the mastery of difficult conditions the plasticity that adjusts to out-of-the-way exigences the circumvention of space as in migration and the conquest of time as in hibernation we begin to get an impression of the insurgence of life we see life persistent and intrusive spreading everywhere insinuating itself adapting itself resisting everything defying everything and surviving everything the great sequoia trees may be taken as emblems of life's tenacity for they have been known to flourish for over two thousand years one of the oldest had two thousand four hundred twenty five annual rings when it was killed and must have begun to live five hundred twenty five years before the christian era we have wrote professor w r dudley deep in their annual rings records which extend far beyond the beginnings of anglo-saxon peoples beyond even the earliest struggles for liberty and democracy among the greeks records of forest conflagrations of the vicissitudes of the seasons of periods of drought and periods of abundant and flourishing rains in our conception of life we must not forget the sublime instances of its power to endure End of section eleven